Before we dive in, I'd like to be clear that this short presentation is by no means the definitive guide to the history of underwear. My goal is to get you thinking outside of your 21st century box so you can write better details into your world building. As I always like to say when talking about historical material culture, even if you're writing fantasy, the bones of your world need to make some kind of organic sense. Since your readers or viewers are going to be humans living on Earth, using historical foundations for your world, in this case literally, will give your work verisimilitude. With that in mind, let's dive in! Underwear. It's not really a secret what we mean by the term, or is it? Just a bit over a hundred years ago, drop in the clothing history bucket, underwear meant something like this or this. Nowadays, it can be as basic as this, or as over the top as this. Our conception of underwear and the purpose it serves didn't change much until the 20th century. Up until very recently, this was considered underwear. So why even bother? And what's the point of underwear? Why do we need to be careful when mentioning unmentionables in our writing, especially in historical or historically inspired work? If you're in the pre-woven fabrics era, wearing hides and furs and fig leaves, this isn't so much of a consideration. Write your version of Clan of the Cave Bear and don't worry much about what's under that wolf hide. With the invention of the loom, all this changes. Now you have a comfy fabric made from animal fur fibers or plant fibers that you can cut and fit to your body shape and joy of joys, wash it when it gets dirty. Underwear fabric, and this includes shirts of course, until the import of cotton from India in the 18th century and then the invention of the cotton gin is linen and wool in the West. In the East, India and Asia, cotton goes way back and silk if you're fancy. In the West, England and the Americas, for instance, you can find cotton underwear as early as the 16th century, but don't look for it outside of, say, Queen Elizabeth's wardrobe. Now, it takes a lot of work to go from sheared, washed, carded, spun, woven wool, or cotton, or linen, or silk, to a finished garment, and it sure would be a shame if that laboriously produced garment became unwearable after a while because of, well living life in the real world. To cut to the chase, underwear is meant to protect outerwear from, not to put too fine a point on it, body soil. You know, sweat, dirt from grubby necks and hands and other things we needn't go into. Up until fairly recently, the late 19th century, really, the average person might only have one or two sets of outerwear, but unless extremely impoverished, you would have plenty of underthings. Ever wonder why women, even royalty, are always sewing in historical novels and why there are so many paintings throughout history of women spinning, weaving, and sewing? Well, there were no ready-made clothes for most of history. You made it yourself or you commissioned bespoke or tailor-made clothes. Mending always needs to happen in outerwear, but since underwear got the most abuse when it comes to cleaning, we'll get into that later, it's something you were always making more of. Guess what a lady's trousseau mostly consisted of back in the day? And by trousseau, if you don't know the term, it's your hope chest or the, the set of suit of clothings and linens that you would make, hoping that you were going to get married and need them someday. Petticoats, chemises, drawers, hankies, neckerchiefs, you get the idea. Anyway, while today fabric is relatively cheap and labor relatively expensive, prior to the early 20th century, fabric was expensive, but labor was cheap, or free, as in homemade. This means that, compared to today and our practically disposable everyday clothes, even common clothing prior to recent decades was cared for, refashioned, handed down, made over into something for the children, given to the servants, and eventually made into quilts, and probably after that made into washing rags which is why it's hard to find lower class clothing in museum collections. Unlike fabrics which were kept clean with brushing, airing, and spot cleaning, for the most part, underwear is something you can safely wash. And by wash, I mean boil. Outer garments, whether made of wool, linen, hemp, or silk, were cleaned by airing, brushing, and spot cleaning, or blotting with various powders, 
For undergarments, prior to modern detergents, bleaches, and oh-so-lovely mechanical washing machines, whites were boiled in coppers or other stovetop tubs with harsh soaps, then hung on lines or a pulley in the kitchen or a dedicated laundry room if you were rich and fancy or out in the sun to dry. Cuffs, collars, and tuckers, also known as shirt fronts or bibs, were then starched and ironed to a high gloss, not only making them smooth and crisp, but the starch acts as a kind of Teflon coating to prevent dirt or whatever from getting into the fibers. When the item is washed later, the grubbiness floats away with the starch. And this is why, until recently, with the dawn of aniline dyes and then synthetic fabrics, all shirts, chemises, drawers, anything that came in direct contact with the body were white. Ladies' things could sometimes be pink or flesh-colored. You see that a lot in the late 19th century. But the only reason you'd see pink men's underdrawers would be if they washed them with something red. Oops, don't laugh, it happened. So all those black pirate shirts at the Ren Fair or in TV shows like Bridgerton? Yeah, pure fantasy, enabled by modern fabrics and washing techniques and dyes. Even if you were really into wearing black as a sign of conspicuous consumption in, say, the 16th century, as was popular with Spanish nobility, your shirts? Yeah, they're still white. Another interesting detail is the lack of fasteners on especially lower-class shirts and drawers until fairly recently. Okay, have you noticed how often I say fairly recently? Have you noticed it usually means late 19th century or early 20th century? Two words, industrial revolution. Anyway, if you look at extant undergarments from prior to the late 19th century, you'll see no buttons except on very fancy underwear for the rich or nobility, like, say again, the Queen of England. Buttons don't respond well to boiling or scrubbing, especially buttons made out of wood or bone, or in the 19th century, things like vegetable ivory, which would just melt in boiling water. Baby clothes, which are of course washed a lot, were fastened with ties and or pins. Even a lot of outerwear was fastened with pins, like women's open front gowns of the mid to late 18th century, or tapes slash ties, like you'll see in many Regency era gowns. This is not to say that the undergarments, especially as we get well into the 19th century, didn't start to acquire buttons. Just remember that the buttons would have to be removed for washing and then reattached afterward. The last vestige of this situation is probably baby diapers, cloth and pin style, and dressy men's shirts. You ever wonder why men's black or white tie dress shirts have studs instead of buttons? Like ecclesiastical vestments and habits, dressy menswear harkens back to an earlier time. For nuns habits, the style was codified in the Middle Ages, and the cool orders, in my opinion, still dress that way. For tuxedos and white tie, this is the 19th century. Remember my comments about pre-fabric animal hide clothing predating the use of underwear? Of course, we do see hide clothing in use in culturally frozen populations like North American Native peoples well into the 19th century. Today, there are many descendants of these people keeping those leatherworking skills, like brain tanning to make velvety buckskin, alive and well. That said, when you attend a festival featuring traditionally garbed Native Americans or a mountain man rendezvous, you can bet there's some woven fabric happening where you can't see it. Nobody likes sweaty buckskin. While we're talking about buckskin, let's get that mountain man trope out of the way. Yes, trappers and explorers wore buckskin suits while they were in the field, especially if they were out in the wilderness for any length of time. Even good wool wasn't going to last forever, and when your resupply was months away, you made do. Despite what Hollywood, especially the 1950s through 70s, would lead us to believe, Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone and other historical characters of note weren't walking around town after months of hunting, trapping, or exploring dressed in animal skins. That would have been considered over the top, if not barbaric. They also didn't wear dead animals on their heads, but that's a topic for another presentation. Well, that depends on where and when you're talking about. 
If we're talking undershirt or under gown type garments for women, pretty much everybody around the non-equatorial world. Are we talking an under kimono in feudal Japan? That's basically the equivalent of a western chemise or undershirt and serves the usual purpose, protect the expensive outerwear. In the West, what we call a shirt was considered underwear until fairly recently, as in the early to mid 20th century. You're not going to see a respectable man out in public without his jacket on or at least a waistcoat until well into the 20th century. Here's another aside. Men's shirts did not open all the way down the front until into the 20th century. No exceptions. Another aside, 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 if you want a great look at early 19th century shirts, check out Pinsent Tailoring's YouTube video from January 14th, 2021. Here's a warning. He's pretty hard on that Netflix show, Bridgerton. I already mentioned it once, and with good cause. Other warning, Bridgerton's going to come up later in this talk. If we're talking under pants now... Until the late 19th century, not everybody wore them. Women, especially ladies, did not commonly wear drawers, with some exceptions, until well into the 19th century. Bifurcated garments, quote-unquote, were considered masculine. If you think about this for a minute, you can see why riding horses astride versus side saddle and later on riding a bicycle started out as controversial pursuits for a respectable lady. Let's address a pet peeve of historical costumers everywhere. This is the term bloomers. Bloomers are not underwear. Be careful of this term, especially if you're writing a novel. I see authors use this term all the time in historicals from Elizabethan to Edwardian. I know they're referring to underdrawers, but bloomers are not underwear. Unfortunately, some point in the early 20th century, somebody started calling girls underpants bloomers and it stuck as slang. This slang does not apply before probably the 1920s, maybe? I don't know. Where did they get the term? They got it from a brief attempt by dress reformers to normalize trousers for women in the early mid-19th century. Drawers are not meant to be seen. Bloomers, were, however, were worn under a mid-length skirt or a skirted jacket. They were basically trousers. Then there are pantalettes, a brief fad in the early 1800s, and became part of the whole Little Bo Peep look by the 1830s. They are drawers that go all the way to the ankles, usually with lots of tucks and lace, and they are meant to be seen. They stuck around as a thing for little girls until the end of the 19th century. They're sort of a weird underwear but not underwear thing, because fashion is weird. Okay, back to regular old drawers. There are exceptions to the every man wore drawers rule. During the American Civil War, there were stories of poor ignorant country boys who enlisted in the army. They were issued uniforms, including drawers, and then they'd show up for duty wearing just the drawers because they thought those were, I don't know, summer trousers? Oops. I mean, they didn't know what they were. Simple soldiers in the 1860s aside, in the olden times, let's say 11th through 18th centuries, underwear was often allowed, or expected even, to peek out from your neckline, your sleeve cuffs, or slashes. Nowadays, it's considered tacky, even though many trendy slash trashy, usually young, people do it. What does this say about a person? Well, not excessive class, that's for sure. Now, Madonna made visible underwear her signature style back in the 80s. It was overt costuming. It was a fashion statement. She was the master of reinventing her style every few years. She did it with verve. It was intentional, not accidental. One thing costume historians and reenactors will sometimes disagree about is whether the chemise is or shift is worn over or under the drawers. When we're talking about when women started wearing drawers in the middle of the 19th century. I think it depends on when you are in the 19th century, where you are, and how complicated your layering is. Wearing the chemise under the drawers is very, very practical. And I speak from experience. I used to do Civil War reenacting. It means now you basically have complete underpants by wrapping the front and back of the chemise up through your legs. You're still able to answer a call of nature, and you don't have to take all your clothes off to do it. So it's pretty, it's nice. It's nice. 
Now, if you're wearing combinations, which is a combination of a, basically a camisole and drawers, like a little onesie, or in the 1910s, a princess slip over your corset to get a nice smooth line, this may not be an option. So I think it comes down to personal preference. The main thing is that women's drawers and combinations until the teens or 20s are split in the middle for practical reasons. Once we get to where hems are shorter and layers are down to maybe two, like a slip, a slip only under a dress or a skirt, it's really no longer necessary to have split undergarments. Peak fanciness for women's underwear is probably the Edwardian era. Think Gibson girls, the late 1890s to 1910-ish. Think can-can dancers. Think all those ribbons and ruffles and tucks. The dawn of the home sewing machine was supposed to be a labor-saving device, but humans being what we are, we just took up the slack and made the fashions more complicated. You can see this in the outerwear, too. Ruffles, pleats, and trims, you name it. It's very obvious in the outerwear, but you can see it in the underwear, too. Women's and men's fashion, especially the more expensive and fashion forward you go, is usually trying to reduce and expand various regions of the body to conform to some kind of unnatural ideal in the name of improving on nature. It can get out of hand, especially in the upper classes. Corsetry for women of some type or another came and went from the Middle Ages until the 16th century where it became ubiquitous and only disreputable, poor, or otherwise low types of women went without stays. Yes, that's where the term loose woman comes from. Before we go any further on this topic, let me be absolutely clear on something. Corsets were never worn without a chemise or other underlayer, period. In order to wash a corset, you'd have to unpick the boning channels, remove all the bones, whether whalebone or reeds or steel. There's a show streaming right now, again, on Netflix. This is Bridgerton. I told you I was going to mention it again. It's a general train wreck of historical costuming. It's supposed to be set in the Jane austen sort of Regency era, but it's all over the place. One of the worst grievances is showing the sores from corset chafing like it was a thing. It's never been a thing. For some reason in this fantasy world of Bridgerton, women don't wear chemises. I, whatever. This is a prime example of taking care not to do your costume research by watching film and TV because you could slip on this kind of a banana peel. But I digress. A more common misconception is the specter of tight lacing. This was a supposed fad with young women in the second half of the 19th century, and it led to apocryphal tales of women passing out from lacing their stays too tightly and even having ribs surgically removed. Be very careful if you choose to use this trope. The surgery myth has never been substantiated. Just think about what that would actually mean before the age of anesthesia and antiseptics. And young girls were hardly passing out all over the place. Save the tight lacing for a vain, ridiculous character because it was just wasn't a thing. Extant corsets in costume collections with 14-inch waists or whatever are extant for a reason. One, most of them probably belong to young girls who grew out of them pretty quickly. And two, corsets aren't laced all the way closed. You want to have at least a one-inch gap so you can cinch it in if you drop a little weight. Um, and you could... You could your weight can change throughout the day. Uh, also, if you've got a brand new corset, you want a good gap because the fabric's going to stretch a little bit. Oh, and by the way, some men wore corsets too. Even to this day, vanity is not purely female. you got to have that manly, fashionable figure. Another great way to make the waist look small is to enlarge every other dang thing on yourself, including hair. Padding, bust improvers, frilled corset covers... Stuff that goes over your bum, over your hips, bustles, you name it. The Regency, also known as the Era of Austin, was a lovely reprieve from all of this squeezing and padding, for the most part. The graceful columnar silhouette was a callback to classical Greece, going so far as to even pare down to minimal underthings. Gown plus chemise plus stays and stockings were good. It only lasted a few decades, and we were back to layers of petticoats, leg of mutton sleeves, and big hair. Fashion loves to overreact. 
and overreact it did in a big, literally big way. Not only did corsets nip the waist back in, but women piled on petticoats, and even with sloping shoulders somehow part of this hot mess, sleeve reached possibly their most poofy extreme, requiring boning and or padding for support. Men were not exempt from this. Padding was adopted by men with less than ideal musculature. Shoulders and chest goes without saying, but you can build that structure into your coats. Until menswear shifted from breeches to trousers, padding for thighs and calves could be used by dandies looking to present a well-turned leg. So when does neckwear stop becoming underwear and become an accessory? Neck cloths are a practical addition to any wardrobe, no matter the era. In the 18th century and early 19th, they really seem almost a part of the shirt and something you can change out during the day to look tidy without having to replace your whole shirt. These evolve into stocks, which remain in military use well into the 19th century, eventually replaced with neckties. At that point, they're definitely an accessory. The female version of this neckwear is the fichu and the partlet. Fichus in wool, linen, and later silk and cotton, too, are a staple to fill in that daytime décolletage from the dawn of recorded history till the mid-19th century. Partlets eventually become the tucker, which is also the name for a false shirt front, staple of men's evening wear for most of the 19th century and into the early 20th. This is where we get the term bib and tucker Cuffs and collars, too, are basically a kind of underwear since they serve to protect outer garments from dirt, sweat, and other things that need washing away. They were always a separate thing until the early 20th century. So practical! Again, white, so they can be washed and starched. Waistcoats, not technically underwear, were always worn from about 1700 to the 1950s undress, quote-unquote, usually meant down to the waistcoat, often with some kind of banyan or robe over it. This evolves into things like the smoking jacket. Needless to say, a gentleman did not remove his jacket in public unless doing labor or sports. Lower class fashions change very slowly until the mid-20th century. People tend to wear the fashions of their youth, This is more of a thing in outerwear and hairstyles, but it's something to think about if you're looking for ways to differentiate generations in your writing. As a last thought, when doing research, remember that the Renaissance painting of a biblical or other historical scene is probably not an accurate depiction of, say, 30 BC Mesopotamia or ancient Rome. Quote, ye olden days, unquote, seems to be a pretty vague concept. So you're going to see a lot of 16th century paintings with Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus in medieval clothes because, you know, that's olden times. So be careful of getting costuming clues from artwork. The same thing with mid to late 19th century depictions of earlier periods of history. Google is also not always your friend. If you search for tuxedo, you're going to get a thousand hits of guys in tailcoats. Tailcoats is not a tuxedo. A tux is a dinner jacket and a black bow tie, but I digress. Here are some great resources for your historical garment research. On the web, a great place to start is www.costumes.org. It's basically a one-stop research hub. It used to be the Costumers Manifesto, but they changed a few years ago. For books, here's a sampling of the good stuff. Juanita Leish, who wrote Who Wore Wet, is a wonderful researcher who does a lot of uh, Civil War era stuff. I know her things might be harder to find. You can probably buy them directly from her. Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion is a staple of historical costumers the world over. She, her, you can just basically make things right out of those books. She's diagrammed original garments. The Tudor Tailor is a newer offering. Uh, Their website is here on the screen, and they have great resources online and a wonderful book. American Duchess has a book on 18th century dressmaking. Again, they have great online resources and a YouTube channel, and uh, it's a really great resource. 
And of all the other books I have, the one one of them that stands out is Calico Chronicles, Texas Women and Their Fashions by Betty J. Mills. Uh, it's It might be a little harder to find too, but it's worth looking for. Now, if you can find them anywhere, this fabulous century is a set of books by Time Life that's great for clothing and other material culture. Uh, the first one covers 1870 to 1900, and the rest of them cover one decade each, all the way up to about 1960. But um, anyway, you'll, you'll see them, the spines look like this. They're a great resource for um, material culture, all kinds of stuff. They, um, I mean, they're just, they're just full of great images like this. So, anyway, this fabulous century, time life, probably really hard to find, but worth it if you can find some. I've seen them in antique stores or thrift stores or used bookstores. YouTube has turned out to be a cornucopia of information for those willing to do a little bit of hunting. Karolina Zabrowska is in Poland and does everything from the 16th century to the 1940s. She does most of her videos in English. Sometimes she'll do something in Polish and then she'll do funny subtitles because she's awesome. Morgan Donner is a reenactor who does historical sewing and research. She does a lot of medieval stuff, but some later things too. Bernadette Banner does historical clothing reconstruction and commentary on historical films and TV. She has a recent commentary on Bridgerton, of course. She's very well spoken. Pinsent Tailoring is Zach Pinsent. He's in England. He's a world class tailor who lives, basically lives, in Regency clothes all the time. He makes clothes for many periods. He's the one I mentioned earlier with the commentary about the Bridgerton costuming. He does a, it's on Bridgerton menswear. Thanks for watching, and thanks to LTUE for giving me this opportunity to give you a whirlwind tour of the history of underwear. Not exhaustive, but I hope it gives you something to think about. And now we're going to open the floor for a question and answer.